Today's episode of the BS Podcast is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. Since 1981, find the best tickets for sporting events, music, wrestling, opera, March Madness, you name it. What better way to grab bargain tickets for NHL and NBA teams that are already out of the running? And soccer. What's up? Are there any more qualifiers, Steve Nash? Uh, not for a few months. Okay. He well, when the well qualifiers on. come, you can do SeatGeek. I have SeatGeek on my phone. By far the easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to the revolutionary grading system. Everything is fully guaranteed. Try it out. Download the SeatGeek app today. Go to right to SeatGeek.com. We are also brought to you by TuneIn. Major League Baseball finally back as the new season gets underway. The Ringer Podcast Network has baseball fans covered with the Ringer MLB show playing exclusively on the TuneIn app for the month of April. TuneIn has radio broadcasts for MLB uh basketball hockey it's amazing i get to listen to my celtics announcers i actually checked it out recently it's good yeah it is i like hearing my announcers because they they get mad about the calls like i get <laughs> mad so i feel like i'm living vicariously through them on top of that the ringer podcast network has partnered with TuneIn to give baseball fans a free 30-day trial of TuneIn premium to listen to every live home call from every mlb game around the league catch the ringer mlb show only on TuneIn during april and with your premium subscription you can listen to live mlb games on TuneIn. just go to tunein.com slash ringer and subscribe, download the TuneIn app, start listening today. Tune in, your everything audio app. And one last thing, the Channel 33 podcast. We had Reese Witherspoon Day in the ringer. Yeah, we did a we did a podcast on the Channel the 33 show, about right? her career. Do you like Big Little Eyes? Uh, yeah, Some good Monterey yeah, footage. Yeah, a great Monterey footage. Yeah. That's like the star of the show. Well, but if uh, you love Reese Witherspoon, on your ride home, you can listen to our Reese Witherspoon you go, podcast. All right, Pearl Jam, let's bring him in. Steve Nash coming up right now. All right, the two-time MVP, I was texting him last week, and every time I see the way basketball is played now, and there's a point guard just doing his thing with the floor spread, I just think to myself, Steve Nash must be watching this and just getting sad and bummed out. Wait, have you come to grips with this? You, met, you, you were like 10 years early. You, met, you just would have gone nuts. I like it, you know. You I, like it? I, yeah, like jealous. I'm not... <clears throat> no, you know, like I'm, I'm a guy that... Came to basketball at 13 years old, had one scholarship offer, and played till I was 40. So like, <laughs> you did play till you're 40. I, I, you know, and <laughs> so I feel like I, I drenched every bit of sweat I could out of it, and uh, enjoyed it, and and I'm happy for these guys that get to play in a game that's open and free. I think it's a great game. I think the game is uh, at, a, at a, you know, one of the peaks of its history. Yes, the way it's played, the amount of talent, athleticism. Um, you can make a lot of criticisms about it, and, and I would understand that. But I, I think it's fantastic, and I love to see the guys wild and free and playing. Of the teams, of your best teams, so I would say, what was the year Dirk got hurt? O two Mavs. Yeah. Um, was that O two? Yeah, O two because O three. That team was good. O yeah. two O three Mavs era, and yeah. then the O five O six O seven Suns. Yeah. And then the two thousand ten Suns. I think those that were your six team. best teams. Which of those teams were built the best for right now, 2017? Because they all had pieces of it yeah. in, the, in those It's a teams. good question. I've never really thought about that. I mean, the Dallas one seems so long ago that I don't I even think about it. You know, it's <laughs> like, and, and they had so much success after that team kind of changed. And then we had success. So I never really go that far back. But I think that team might have been a little young. Like Dirk and I both were a little, maybe, let's say, a little early in our careers to but we would have been successful in this type of play. When but, you say uh, early, does that mean <clears throat> from just like getting the crunch time reps or yeah. going through the mo or just yeah, that you didn't I know mean, the work ethic yet? No, we always had the work ethic. We always had the work ethic. And I think as a matter of fact, you, you kind of have to be smarter about your work as you get older. But I think we just, that, that, that know how and yeah. the games know how to win games and, and, we were doing it. We'd gotten ourselves to the conference finals in Dallas, but I still think we had more improvement to make there before we really knew what we were doing. And, you know, we both went on to do it, so to speak, uh, in the future. But uh, neither of us, I think, were quite at our, at, in our prime yet at that stage. The 05 Suns, that, that one had Joe. Mm -hmm. Quinn Richardson, a really good year from him. Yeah. I don't think Raja was there yet, but Raja Amari, wasn't there like, yet. at his, at we his were, athletic apex. Yeah. We were, we, our starting five was great. We were a little thin on yeah. the bench. Um, 
but man, we were running people out of the building and that team too was all new. You know, you know, like LeBron's first year in Miami, his first year back in Cleveland, like some of these teams, these super teams, it'll be interesting for Golden State, yeah. especially with Kevin coming back late. Um, that first year, because you get in the playoffs, the intensity, uh, the adversity, the crowd, whatever it is, you have to have that knowing look amongst each other. Yeah. I, I've been here, but we've been here before collectively and we're good. Instead of that look like, have we, do you, am I, are you, <laughs> How are, where are we, right. you know? And so I think that's what happened to LeBron against Dallas, you know, yeah. that, that team. I think that's in some ways what happened to, they were injured as well the, against Golden State, his first year back in Cleveland, but they're new teams. I mean, you get in that deep, deep, deep in the playoffs and there's tons of adversity and, and you know, you're, you're fighting up a mountain. It, you know, you need those common experiences. 2010, which wasn't the best Suns team you were on, but no. that team had more of the continuity. And I think yeah. that that's a good example of that really helped you that year. And you guys, nobody remembers this now, but the the ridiculous Kobe air ball that our test yeah. just made one of the best plays of his career yeah. and somehow got the uh, offensive rebound. In. Yeah. But I think you guys could have won that series. I do feel like that was like a coin flip. We could have won that series for sure. We, and that team wasn't maybe as explosive, but it was more balanced, more yeah. experienced, a little more, a little tougher maybe mentally. I think Amari also turned a corner the last three months of that season. You know, and, and of course he goes, you know, and rightfully run. so, goes yeah. to the Knicks. But no, but more than that, Amari kind of turned a corner on just being aware defensively, knowing when to come over and when not to come over, you know, keeping his head on a swivel. Also, offensively, we could go to him in the fourth quarter more because he, he would make better decisions. You know, I think he got caught up in one-on-one -on -one battles earlier in his, in his, you know, in those days where he would charge or turn it over on the layer of defense behind him. Yeah. But he started to re register and, and kind of measure up what was happening. Be, you know, I'm going to beat my guy, so let's not get into it with my guy. Let's yeah. figure out what's happening behind me. He, he was better at that. He also got better at making the extra pass out of the pick and roll. You know, Roger Bell or whoever was in the corner. Um, actually, Roger was, I don't think. Yeah, Roger was on that team. His men's always come in and take Mario on, the, Mario on the roll, and he learned to make that corner pass, which made everything better it just made us more difficult pick your poison for the defense put a lot of pressure under them on them so he was better i also think the first two games in staples we got hosed like we lost by, we, got, we, we lost by 10 but literally we would have had to win by 25 you can't get fined anymore you can no, talk about great. this now you know, yeah what I are mean, they gonna say you know we were like wow we're, we're getting you know we're we're not, you know i thought we think we're playing well we're losing by 10 both nights we go to phoenix and kind of blow them out both games yeah come back and then that's the, the game where Kobe shoots the air ball I believe and uh the right corner yeah right, I gotta right. say that was a phenomenal play by our test it was it, really, it, really it was. was it was we, a great we basketball missed a, play we missed a block, box out and that's it the guy out. in consecutive years made arguably the two biggest plays they had in both those playoffs because in 2000 oh no that was the same year 2010 because he made a three against the Celtics in game seven with a minute left yeah and as he was shooting it, and I was there, you could hear the Laker fans go, no! Yeah, yeah. Like, it was like this, almost like a he, horror movie. He was and good for in. that. He yeah. was always good for that. Like, crazy play that just changed things. Or like, yeah. you know, it, what, what's the word for it? When you just, it's there's 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 no good logic behind what he's doing, but he knows, he, he just does something. He hasn't made a three for a week, and then he makes two big ones. And irrational it changes confidence. the game, right? Irrational yeah. confidence. So. You know, he was good at that, and, and also, he obviously, I think, intimidated people in a good way. You know, to have that much lumber and just be hitting people and keeping people off balance. He definitely played his role. I think the 05 team was the one that had the best chance to win the title looking back, just because it, it, it was kind of a weird year for the league. Mm -hmm. The Spurs, Duncan was really banged up that year. The Spurs won anyway, but it wasn't like... He wasn't lights out or anything. Yeah. And they, they, Manu and Parker was still a little early for them. They got, mm -hmm. Horry really saved them in the finals. Detroit, you know, Detroit was a very good team that it was, it was kind of yeah. a weaker talent pool, I think, 10 years ago than it is now. I don't know if Detroit would have been as dominant. I, I actually thought you guys had the most talent. But as yeah. you said, it was the new team. Right. And then Joe broke his face. True. And that, no, didn't that, help. that hurt a lot. Yeah, he came was, back for the last game of the playoffs. He, well, he wasn't the same. And uh, I actually think he played really well in that last game, but it was like too little, too late for yeah. our team. And, you know, I think they beat us 4 1. I'm not, no. What year was that? It was four, but you were, they were, they were letting you score. They were trying yeah. to Jedi mind trick you and just shoot <clears throat> yeah. every game, remember? Pop. Yeah, take your 40. Best. Take your 40, yeah. Steve Nash. We don't want you setting anyone else up. That was and, good. And, and yeah, he is great. He, he, ma he makes me, uh, he makes players, not just me, but he, he makes you have your own little battle with yourself. Like, yeah, like, because I'm sitting over there 
wanting to pass, wanting to pass, wanting to pass. And yeah. he knows it. Yeah. And he knows that I'm kind of fighting myself. And I think I still played well and had success in, in, whenever I played the Spurs, but he's brilliant. He really is. The, uh, the 07 is the one everyone mentions. The I suspensions? Spurs team, yeah, I thought that Spurs team was really good. I, I Even thinking about it 10 years later, I mean, the suspensions were ludicrous. Yeah. I, I really hated that they did that. I still feel like the Spurs were really good that year. It would have they been a good. task to beat them. They, they were they were good. I still feel, and I don't look back like blaming or, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm like, we lost. We lost. Yeah. But, you know, if you want to break it down, I mean, we went home, I think, with a chance to go up 3-2. Uh, yeah. And we missed Amari and Boris, and we were thin on the front line. And we were winning until the last minute at home and lost. And so I don't remember that part. Yeah, it was we, close. We we were we I think were up three in, in the last minute. Uh and hadn't had they hadn't had the lead until the last minute at least. And they beat us by three maybe. But uh so we hung on valiantly, we got beat and then go back out there and they, they beat us. But uh you know, I like to think that that team if we had been able to get through the Spurs, had a pretty decent look at it. You know, I think that was Utah and then Cleveland, maybe yeah, a, a so, Cleveland team that had yeah, no yeah. business being in the finals. Right, and Utah. I think we'd, we'd beaten Cleveland by thirty both times that year. Yeah. I mean, you know, not not to say that that means everything, but you know, it means something. It wasn't a great. You think about the talent now versus the talent ten years ago. I don't know what the reasons are. They don't totally make sense. But there's no doubt. There's just more great players now, what, more very what, good players. If you had to come up with some reasons, what would they be? I've thought about this. I think I think part of it, I think the rookie scales really helped. Mm -hmm. And the fact that guys have to earn their contracts now versus when you you were drafted, what were you, 98? Yeah. 96. Uh, you 96, could get like a $60 million yeah. deal. Right. So 96, Antoine's in the league for three years. He gets $80 million. Mm -hmm. you know it's and they're just handing out giant contracts right. left and right i think it really damaged the guys from yeah. that decade and it made them you know it's also it was also different i don't think the nba did as good a job of kind of preparing guys when they sure. came in the league and things like that and now you have it's not just this generation it's the lebron generation i think has been really good for the next generation because those guys they handle their business off the court. I mean, it's not like you didn't, but you're, mm -hmm. a lot of people in your generation didn't, and they didn't take care of themselves yeah. off the court. And the LeBron generation, they have their business yeah, squared away professionals. off the court. Yeah, they're pros. They take care of their bodies. Yeah. And I think these new guys come in, and they want to catch up to those guys, yeah. and they see what they do. And now it's like this. Right. It's, it's evolution in a way, right? Like that generation took it to another level now the next generation is taking it yeah i also think i also wonder if the specialization of sports has something to do with it you know or, in a good way yeah uh well good and bad i think in some ways it's bad oh you're talking about like youth sports yeah like i'm saying that nba players nowadays have to choose basketball from the time they're 10 11 12 yeah whereas maybe earlier they were playing different sports so maybe you get guys that are you get more kind of talent in the nba but on the negative side i, I what i've been hearing is that when you see a 19, 20 year old's MRI when he comes in the league, it's bad and doesn't look like it did 20 years ago that's because guys were playing all sorts of different sports. Yeah. Um, now, I know that's a bit of a generalization, but it's something to consider, I think. Well, think about it, especially if you're playing on cement. I yeah. think cement is just the death I, of. But I, I don't I don't think kids anymore play on cement. I really don't. You think so like during the summers all, they're playing you know, on courts? Sports is totally monetized, so it's all yeah. programmed. So whether it's monetized through an AAU coach, you know, or it's monetized through, you know, your parents buying you private lessons. Yeah. You know, e at either end of the spectrum, financially, I think it's it's been monetized. And so it's all programmed. Like, you don't see, like, the parks, there's no kids playing pickup in the parks anymore. I grew up playing pickup outside. And it was important. In the streets like, of Canada? In the streets, man. <laughs> you put, put your mittens on? In the on? streets <laughs> and the rinks of Canada. Um, but, you know, we'd always meet after school. You knew where there was parks. Or we'd go to the university and play with the college team or college kids and, you know, if you lose, you have to sit for a while. And that taught something different. Like, I think there's more talent in the league today, but I think there's also more specialists. Whereas I, you look back, I think, like, think about the backup centers in the 80s. Like, they couldn't play in today's game, but no. the, they knew how to play. They knew yeah. how to set picks, to pass, to roll, to read and react, to post up. You know, things like that are, are you know, first of all, centers can't really play in our game anymore. But, uh, no. but 
you know, they, well, they, they can't they can shoot threes. Right. Yeah. It's gotta be like yeah. Kelly. Olenek. It's gotta be like the, the fakest center of all time. Yeah. Be a stretch four, but so the game is just an evolution. Part of it's an evolution. Part of it's a cycle. And, you know, I mean, look, even the college games influence, look at Oregon, you know, they, they're like, they have the, the kid that's not really a big in bell. He's mobile six, seven. I don't know what he is, but he's kind of a mobile forward that plays, yeah. that guards the pain. They lost Boucher, but they had four playmakers around him. You know, I mean, that's, they're in the final four without their six, 10 shot blocking three point shooter. I mean, I don't know if that ever happens in the previous eras where you just get four playmakers. I mean, they're all very good, but four playmakers around a six, seven guy in college basketball, you usually get beat up on the glass, give up way too many offensive rebounds and you get beat, but we have Mark Titus writes college troops for the ringer for us. And he was just like, he always picks a team with a good point guard who could play defense. Yeah. He's like, that's college basketball. And so I was kind of watching for it this year. And it did seem like for the most part, those are the teams that advance. I, I've been really impressed by how the point guard position has evolved in all these different directions. I think your era, the point guard, there were basically two types. It was like the traditional point guard like you. And then there was like the Gilbert arenas type point guard. Yeah. The, I'm going to shoot first, clear out, which mm -hmm. kind of was the, the nephew of the Michael Jordan era. And now you have all these guys, like, I guess Kyrie Irving's a point guard, but right. he's, it's more like they're creators now. Sure. I don't even I don't even know if we should necessarily use the word point guard yeah. anymore. James Harden's not a point guard. He's just creates stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? Playmakers. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, in the purest sense of the word, there's not a lot of point guards because the positions change. So I don't even think it's worth arguing or saying, like, you're not a point guard. Who cares? Like, yeah. you're a playmaker. You doesn't make plays. Matter. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, Kyrie may not be a point guard in the purest sense of the word. But like ever since Gilbert and then, you know, Derek Rose even and and Russell, you know, those guys are just they just make plays. They just attack and they put so much pressure on the defense with their overall game that, you know, they have a huge influence on the game, obviously. And and why why do you need a pure point guard if you got a guy that's putting that much pressure on the defense? With that said, then you see somebody like Lonzo. Mm. And you're like, Oh yeah, right, yeah that's that's, a that's pure what a point, point guard. guard. Like yeah. you just Anytime they get a rebound, you just see the big guys are like, where's yeah. Lonzo? I got to get it. And everybody else is running because they yeah. know they can get the ball. There's I still, miss that. There's still room for pure point guards for sure. Yeah. It's just a matter of like, if you know, how many are there? And if not this guy, why would you take a pure point guard just for the sake of it? You know, I mean, like, I, I think like even like, you know, little examples, the, I mean, Lonzo is great, but um, the point guard in Philly, uh, Kid from Arizona, like oh, yeah, yeah, TJ McConnell. I mean, he's a pure point guard. He makes yeah. your team better. Yeah. I like watching Philly a little bit. And, I do too. And and you know, like he just he's he's kind of overmatched in a lot of ways, but he's smart. He's tough, and he can make plays. And he's a pure point guard. And there's still tons of value for that. Well, I how think. about Jameer Nelson? He's I think he was in your draft. Yeah. <laughs> and and he's still like on Denver. It's because he's just old school. You know, he, I, don't, right I don't think that was him when he came in the league. No, I don't either. He, he was the opposite, but now he's realized how to have longevity. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's still a value in, in the pure point guard. There's just not a lot of them. I think Lonzo Ball, you know, he's he's an interesting one because he, he has a feel and can can read and, and make guys around him better. And I don't know. It's an argument that's, that's tough. The thing I think that's cool about him is he, the pace that he has is just different. The rhythm, the rhythm of how he, what he's trying to do, the game usually kind of ends up taking the form of what he wants, mm -hmm. which was what made the Kentucky game so interesting because Fox is such a freak athlete. Mm -hmm. Fox is just like, I'm picking you up full court. I'm not, yeah. I'm not giving you that pace. Right. You're going to have to, you're going to have to be compromised sure. and it worked. Yeah. And I think he's just, he's part of his growth. He's just got to learn to be more aggressive. You know, I, I totally agree. I get, was upset at yeah. Lonzo because I I'm yeah. like the biggest Lonzo fan. I just think he has yeah. it, and I was just like, just attack this guy. Yeah. What are you doing? Right. Yeah. He definitely. I think he was a little, and I don't know if this is a trait of his. He was a little low energy, and he and he wasn't aggressive enough. And I think he'll learn because he, yeah. he's a competitor. You know that he'll learn. Like I can't sit back if things aren't going my way. I'm not getting a free wheel. I got to put my head down and get to the basket and make plays, get to the line, you know, well, look I mean, for how, many, shots. how old were you when you realized how to do that at the highest level? You were like 23, 24. And, I mean, even, even, you know, at the, at the NBA level, even a couple of years, maybe later, like 26, 27. I mean, nowadays kids are coming to the league so early, they're developing faster. You know, in my day, you know, I, I went four years, which sounds amazing. Right. Yeah. But that's, that was, that was most half the guys went 
a full college term. So I was like, you know, you, you learned at different paces, you earn things more. I mean, I still remember going in the gym my rookie year and AC Green kicking the balls all around the gym and telling me to go pick them up. <laughs> like, that's never happening today. <laughs> right. You know, kids are like, not picking them up. Yeah. Sorry. You know what I mean? And they're on a Twitter feed or something. And, and so it's just different. And Twitter feed. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's different and, and, and not all for bad. I'm not the guy that's like back in my day. I'm just saying like, it's different and that's natural. And, um, and it's great for what it's great for. And we miss some of the things that we miss. All right, let's take a quick break to talk about baseball. Red Sox fantasy. I'm pumped. Baseball is starting. And guess what? You need T-Mobile. They're giving away a free year of MLB.TV premium. That's an almost $113 value, absolutely free, and only for T-Mobile customers. And oh, yeah, here's the best part. With T-Mobile One, unlimited data means unlimited baseball. Unlimited data. Is it data or data, Tate? Data. Data, thank you. You know I can't, you know I can't pronounce certain words. Unlimited data. Keep up with your favorite team from almost anywhere. Every pitch, every big moment, every walk-off homer. All without worrying about blowing up your phone bill. Stream, post, and share all things MLB. Here's how you get it. First, get T-Mobile, obviously. Second, download the T-Mobile Tuesdays app from the App Store. And third, this is important, on April 4th, get your free year of MLB.TV premium through the T-Mobile Tuesdays app or go to T-Mobile.com backslash MLB. And we should mention top 3% of data users may notice reduced speeds, activate, HD feature, otherwise videos typically streams on at 480p, web enabled mobile device and qualifying service required, MOB trademarks used with permission, blackouts, other restrictions apply, see terms of use for details. Back to Steve Nash. One thing that happened in your career that I always thought was one of the strangest things, the strangest roster things in the history of the NBA was for at least a year, you were on the same team with Jason Kidd and Kevin Johnson. I think Jason Kidd, I haven't made my list of the of the greatest ever. I haven't done it in a while. Jason Kidd's in the top 40 ever, especially like the longevity he had. Mm. And he was, you know, the best point guard in the league for four or five years in the early 2000s. And then KJ, you know, didn't have the long career and had, had trouble staying on the court, but his, his apexes mm -hmm. were way, way up there. Like he, he was, was just completely undefendable. Yeah. And then you're on that team too. Yeah. Is that was that good or bad for you? Both. I mean, I think it would have been interesting if I had got a chance to play a lot early on, but it's the cards I was dealt, so I approached it the best way I could. And I think one of the best accomplishments in my career was my second year in the league was Danny Ainge played all three of us together and I got to play like 22, 24 minutes a game. And for for him to like for me to earn those minutes and yeah. and, and and largely because I had a coach that was like screw it, I'm going to play all three of them. Um, that was a huge accomplishment and like that was, I put a ton of work in and, and, and thought like, look, I got two, like, you know, maybe hall of fame guys ahead of me two kind of all-star caliber guys ahead of me. If I work hard though, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm knocking on the door and Danny rewarded me. And did he play you all at the same time? Yes. The three were he out did. there together. Yes. So what were you like in the corner? Uh, yeah. But I mean, if you got the ball, go, right. I mean, Danny was amazing to play for. For me, like he, I remember I was, you know, I was a rookie and I, I didn't have a big like hype machine or anything, you know. Yeah. I'd, if I dribble down in front of our bench, he'd be like, take him, take him. Like no offense. He'd just be like, go, yeah. go, take him. Because he'd played one-on-one -on -one with me before practice every day and knew, thought I was really good and believed in me and he gave me that confidence. He didn't like hold me back, you know, so. And I was lucky. So I could have been somewhere else where I got to play a ton or I could have been with Danny who still gave me a chance to earn minutes with those two guys. And he gave me a ton of confidence. He'd be like, go, you you know, like attack, make plays. And so that was an amazing experience for was me Was Kid well. competitive with you? Because at that point he'd only been in the league a couple of years. Like didn't he yeah, think of you as competition? Not really because I hadn't really, I think, shown the levels that I, I, I went on to show early in Dallas. And But I think that, I think he could see it you know, I remember that I was gonna that I was coming and I was gonna get there, but he was never competitive. You know, we went back to our college days in the Bay Area, so we'd known each other and were friends. Um, but I remember Kevin Johnson saying to me, you know, one of my maybe my rookie year. You know, he's like he said to me one day in the locker room, he's like, you know, you're as good as anybody, as good as anyone I've played with, and and it meant a lot to me. Yeah. Because I I didn't know that yet. You know, I I would try to go at those guys in practice and 
And I think he saw enough. He's like, you have everything. You can do everything that anyone else can do. You just got to believe in yourself. And, you know, that was important for me to see that someone that I thought was kind of unguardable was telling me that I could do whatever. So I've told uh, you this, but I, I remember seeing you in Boston once, went to the Celtic Suns during Chauncey's rookie year before Patino traded him after 50 games. And you torched Chauncey. And I was just like, this guy from Santa Clara? Who? This guy's really, they, what the hell's going on? Like, I just didn't understand it. Like, you knew what you were doing. You could see it. And at that point, yeah. you, I think you were either a rookie. It was 97, so I guess you were second year. It would have been either yeah, yeah. the second half of my rookie year. Then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was like, man, this guy. And then you went to, then you were having back issues. Well, actually, that didn't happen until Dallas. So I had two good, two, you know, development years in Phoenix. And I think they realized we got Jason, who's our franchise point right. guard. Um, we should trade Steve before he becomes a free agent and leaves. And so they traded me to Dallas. What did um, they get for you, do you remember? I can't remember. It was like, uh, I think it was like. Uh, I, be, I think they, Dallas they got a, the I trade. think they got a pick and like maybe Tony Dumas or something like oh, that. Congratulations. That's a, that's maybe, a great honor. So remember. you went to Dallas, then you got hurt. I went to Dallas and it was the lockout. And we were playing oh. a pickup game in like early January and I went to the basket got knocked out of the air fell on my back and my back was was really bothering me and I, I didn't really do much about it but it hampered me that whole 50 game season it really was, was hard on me and then 10 games left in the air we we're you know classic Nelly we we're playing dribble tag to warm up at shoot around one day what's dribble tag like everyone's got a ball and you have to tag the other person to get <laughs> uh, this is this is the NBA folks and uh <laughs> And, and I got back spasms, never had them before in my life. I must have been, I don't know, 23, 24 maybe. Yeah. And uh, I had to get wheeled out of the building. It was like, whoa. Oh my God. I was like, what's going on? Like literally couldn't walk for two days. I freaked down. They told me I had this thing, spondylolisthesis, which is pretty common. I think like 20% of the population has it. But obviously in professional sports, it can be tricky. So, um, you know, that, that was kind of like, you know, that was when the back issue started. But it actually made me a better player because I – met my physical therapist in Vancouver, you know, helped me become a better athlete, helped me be really, really focused on being in shape and preventing injury and all that stuff. So I, I think in, in some ways it, it demanded a lot more of me. When did you, when did you go all in on the dieting and stuff? I think that that's was one of your yeah. legacies is the dieting and <laughs> the sleeping. You were like five, know. six years ahead of everybody. I should open a restaurant chain, brand you, it. You really, I, I'll never forget seeing Jared Dudley asking you what to order at Sundance and being <laughs> like, oh my God, Nash even orders for his teammates. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, JD, that's great. He, um, I, it was kind of an evolution. I think by the time I, you know, like there was a stage where I, th you know, when you, I mean, late nineties, I still thought like a big heaping plate of pasta was yeah. good and at 11 30 at night you know or yeah or even before a game and like god i was like man i have to eat an hour earlier because i still feel full at game time yeah you know like so you learn and learn and learn and then you know i think when i got to phoenix it was when i really realized just just eat as many natural things as possible and less processed or no sugar you right? Know, and cut out the sugars which is a big you know now everyone's doing it you should have had you should be getting royalties yeah, yeah. from the entire league sure people are in sleep chambers you never had a sleep chamber no but i sleep was obviously i realized i was one of the huge i remember know, you told you might even on maybe on my podcast five six years ago you were you had discovered napping the power of napping and that yeah i mean i'm not thing. a great sleeper yeah and i think that sleep what i learned is that it's cumulative you know it's yeah. kind of like you're, and we're always overdrawn and yeah. so any chance to get it back so napping i think is good for that day but it's also a good cumulative over the course of a season if you could nap every day or every game day even you know by the end of the year you've put that much sleep back in your bank account for recovery and just clarity and all those things that you need to perform so sleep's huge i know uh i know you love assessing the point guards as a whole is this are we in like the glory days of point guards right now there's so many of them. yeah yeah, I mean, I mean, it's incredible. There, it, the only interesting thing is that there's not a ton of pure points, but they're amazing point guards. Yeah, I guess like, I should. In, in that, just for argument's sake, you know, like there's no Jason Kidd really out there. No. Or, but, I mean, man, you look around the league and think how many guys are so good. So I would, good. Uh, let me flip it around. That, like if you were playing now. Yeah. The, just the night after night of, oh man, this guy. Yeah. Oh, well, I got, tomorrow I, mean, I got I, this guy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, but I think it was b about the same. It, you had the same situation. Maybe the t maybe it's even better now, but it was so good the last kind of 
tense, maybe oh, six years, you know, yeah. Yeah, the, of my career. I was like, you know, it was the same deal. Maybe it's just even better now, but you still was like, wow, this position is the strongest position in the league all of a sudden. And I remember you telling me early on with Westbrook, you were like, I don't like playing that guy. Yeah, you that guy just, is dick. We're, <laughs> My, we're, I hurt after I play them. We're in different categories of athleticism. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, he's just such a great athlete. So physical, strong, explosive. And, and relentless. Relentless. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, he's, and he's gotten better. You know, he's, he has, like, he's, he's, he's smarter. He's, he's a playmaker now. He wasn't early in his career. I think he, he, you know, he was apt to make a lot of mistakes early in his career. Now he doesn't, you know, like like the way he's played in the playoffs. Uh, you know, he's he's overcome a lot of things to add that to his physicality. I wrote a piece about him like four weeks ago about how I just thought he was doing too much. Mm. I think you can pass a point on a basketball team where when you're doing everything, yeah. it's actually bad for the other guys because then they're not thinking on their own and sure. they're not. You know, oh, oh, now I get to shoot, yeah. and it's one of those things. And he scaled it back the last few weeks. And he's picking his spots more, and they're a really good rebounding team. Like they, they're at least a dangerous first round opponent, yeah, because they can rebound. And because like in the Dallas game the other night, they're 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 down by ten with two and a half minutes left, and he just scored all the points, scored yeah. twelve of the last fourteen in two minutes, and just wins the game. You know, that's why I wouldn't want to play them in the playoffs. Yeah, no, I mean he that, but. I think they're better when he relies on his teammates. I do too. No, no question. You can't, in this league, you can't go through a, a season or a seven-game series and do everything. So I think, you know, if he does relinquish more and more, they'll be a tough out. Yeah. Um, but if he insists on doing it all, I don't think they'll be that difficult. Yeah. I. It would seem like the right amount of shots, not that you'd be like, oh, I can only take 20, but yeah. when he's in that 18 to 21 range and Oladipo has 12 shots and mm -hmm. Adams has eight and it's all spring, Cantor yeah. comes in, he, that's when I think they become dangerous. Yeah. Who, who do you think is the best team out of the ones you watch? Period? Yeah, like who, like who would you bet on if you... I, I mean, I'd Canadians still... Canadians aren't allowed to bet, but if you were allowed still, to bet. I still would I, you know, think Golden State's the best team. Um, There's no if? Like if Durant comes like the... No, I mean, I think, sure, back. there's ifs, but there's ifs with everyone because, yeah. you know, if, if Kevin comes back and isn't quite himself, okay, that's different, but they're still pretty good. <laughs> um, if if they come back, if Kevin comes back and they still are having those first year blues, looking around, wondering what's happening in a tough game, I don't think that's going to be the case with this team, but that that's a factor. You know, but there's factors with every team. Look at every single team. Look at LeBron. Look at the minutes he's logged. Like, is there a Crazy. day where it, 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 you know, blows up in his face or... You know, he's, well, I think it's blowing up. I mean, they, they don't play defense anymore. Yeah. And I can't tell if it's because they have too many below average defenders. Just they, they just pass the point in no return or whether. I think, I think it's fatigue and boredom. That's probably. I, you know, they might prove to be not a great defensive team this playoffs, but I think they can ramp it way back up. You know, if, if he's more focused, has a little more rest in between games, he can demand more of his teammates. Um, you know, he's taken on a lot this year. I mean, that's, that's a burden, you know. You're 14. Yeah, him. and and just the way he plays, and and it's what is how many playoffs, how many finals in a row, like six or something, six like it's crazy. It's this crazy. He's, so his next playoff game will be two hundred, I think, which yeah. is uh, which is awesome. It's because as you know, the playoff games yeah. are like they count as games and a half. Right, it's beyond like that's that's just unfathomable. I mean, and that and that's part of the reason why you know the whole debate, not to bring up a, a topic, but about players sitting out games and yeah, you know, I I just think it's a uh, it's happening. And it's just we're going to go through a two or three year transition here where the fans are going to be mad about it and rightfully so. And then we'll get through to the other side and people accept that that's just the way it is nowadays. And personally, I think that, you know, you look at soccer and players sit all the time. Right. You'll hear coaches in press conference say, yeah, he's he's on fire, but he's in the red now as far as loads and he's going to sit in the next two weeks, one of these games. And they play, you know, twice a week at, at most. So. You know, I think it's something that's evolving. We know what we know in science now and about the body and travel and rest and recovery and injury. It's just inevitable. I, I hate to say it. It sucks for a fan when LeBron comes to L.A. and doesn't play, but it, it's just the way it is. And if you're LeBron and you're, and you're Cleveland and your goal and your fan base is all built around winning a playoff you know, yeah. championship, not the regular season title, you know, that's – and you're judged – 
You know, we are so, I mean, look at the media cycle now and the, how much pressure we put on people. We are judged on winning the NBA finals or nothing. And so I, and then I, there's the day to day cycle too, which is totally day, different, you know? So like, you, you know, and at the end you get crushed if you don't win at all. So it's just the way it is. And especially like we can't have LeBron injured for the finals. Yeah. I, I think they should cut back the number of games. I said that I wrote on Friday, I thought 76 was a good number. You're getting rid of one game a month. I remember when you were playing, when we used to text, you, you know, you'd just be like schedule loss. Yeah. You, you just knew you like the guys in the team almost know half the time, yeah. like, Oh, they, you can look at the schedule and go Tuesday, March 13th, fourth game in five nights. And we're in Utah. We can't win that game. That would be like superhuman. Yeah. It's That's true. not good. It's true. I mean, in, you know, because I work with the Warriors still, it's, you know, you know that they're back to back. They they always play the Spurs on the second night of a road back to back. And, yeah. you know, like there's all this, you know, there's so many, th and that, the next year it could be the opposite, but there's things that you just know that, we're, that the chips aren't stacked for trouble. us and we're yeah. in trouble. And um, so I think there's, there's the schedule. I think 76 would be great. You know, I think it's, it's hopefully doesn't ruin the model and maybe it makes some games more important and so you can get it back. But I also think it's going to help that they're cutting out the preseason games by two weeks or something and stretching the season. That'll yeah. help a lot. You know, little bits help a lot. You know, like we don't have a, the all-star break is tough because like your, your all-stars are, are getting run around town, you know, doing media and events yeah, and they're stuff. Like, and they're, they're like the president. It's harder than the season Yeah, in a way. So while the game isn't more, you know, exerting, it's still, it's harder than the season. Does it bother you that they've just thrown away the All Star game completely? Did it'll, you like it'll the All Star come back. game? It'll come back. I was never the type because it was a little bit too like loosey goosey. Yeah, loosey goosey. Yeah. But um, it was never my thing. But uh, it'll come back. It goes in cycles, I think. And you know, we've pushed too far one way now, and it'll come back a little bit. Quick break to talk about cabbage. If you're wondering how to get the funding needed to run a small business today, cabbage has the answer. Cabbage helps small business owners access simple, flexible funding right away without the headaches that come with applying for a traditional loan. Apply online or from your phone by securely linking your business information to get an automatic decision, no waiting in line, no scanning documents, no tracking down financial statements. And once you are approved, you choose when to use your funds and how much to take. You only pay for the funds you actually use. Cabbage has supported over 100,000 small businesses with $2.9 billion in funding, wow. Visit cabbage.com slash BS. There's no cost to apply or set up your line of credit. And guess what? As a BS podcast listener, when you qualify for funding, you'll get a $100 Visa gift card that you can use anywhere. $100 Visa gift card. Visit cabot.com slash BS. That's cabbage with a K. Cabbage.com slash BS. Back to Steve Nash. You're a big soccer fan. You're talking about the schedule. Premier League was what? 36 games? 35? Premier League, I think is 38. 38? Because, yeah. yeah. Which is how something like Leicester City happens. It's mm -hmm. oh my god, it's the most amazing thing ever. It's like actually it's yeah, even a thirty eight game crazy, season. But, yeah. In the NBA if if like if they had to play an eighty two game season, right. I think stuff would maybe start to even right. out over the course. But I do like that every game is a signature game. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like there's no way it would work. I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah. They would never give up the attendance. But it would be really fun if basketball was just it was just twice a week. Yeah. You know, and it was a 50 game schedule and every time it was everybody just rested at their best. Now, different, it'd different be sport. interesting and it'd be interesting because the amount of hype you could put around matchups yeah. and how important games could be. I don't know that you could model it out where you'd get enough back and you wouldn't because it doesn't make sense. stadiums are only so big and, and TV rep, people have other lives and stuff. But um, it's an interesting thing. I think that that's one of the reasons Leicester City could win is because they were in I basically... You know, the top teams were all playing Champions League or UEFA. That's another thing. That's crazy. You know, and then the FA Cup and then the League Cup. So you add that up. There's, you know, for example, the top teams are playing or at least starting the season in three other competitions, whereas Leicester started in two. Yeah. And and for those top teams, they're putting all their eggs in the basket of the top competition. So, you know, I think that's one factor. I mean, it was a perfect storm, but that, it is crazy that how many – games soccer players actually play and then they only get a six week break and that doesn't include the guys who have to play for their country see i, I would change a lot of if i was the soccer czar first of all i'd have a world cup every three years i don't never the four-year thing drives me crazy yeah, it's like why 
in the yeah. women's world cup should be every two years like they yeah. don't they don't really have anything else right it's, it that should, they should be running that back all the time but uh I, I i've only gotten into soccer like the last eight years it is astounding to me that they have such a short regular season but then at the same time you know barcelona it's february and they have the champion this champions league game and then they have to worry about their yeah. two division games like in the nba that would never happen no be like the Warriors are playing the Spurs today, and then on Saturday yeah. they're playing AC Milan right. in Italy. It's like what right. they would never do that, right? And you know you can get caught in points of the season where you have that congestion. You have so many games and so many big games. Yeah, I mean you'll see them a couple of years ago. Didn't they play like Madrid three times in like nine days yeah. for three like trophies, basically like the league, the cup, and the Champions League, or something? You know, like stuff like that can happen. So I get it. Like these models are there, and people make a ton of money, but that's why this, the sport of soccer and basketball, but soccer is getting so young. Like you just need guys that can run at such speeds for what so about long. Our eighteen-year-old on America, he's amazing. Are you a Canadian citizen or American I am. citizen? This <clears throat> this might be the one that pushes you to become an American citizen. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm, is by I'm, far the best American player we've ever had. Yeah, yeah. I actually, it's one of the rare things that I feel like it's not a big enough deal yet. We've never no. had a guy who can go downhill yeah. at half speed and then turn it on and go nine directions no. and yeah, I mean, the way he, he passes. He watching him play, you would you'd expect him to play for Argentina or Spain. Or, yeah, you know he's that. Or good. like he's Messi's protege or yeah. something. Yeah, I mean he's that good that he's that clever that he can play that quickly of mind and foot. And stop yeah. and slow it down. Yeah. And he has patience with yep. <laughs> two defenders yeah. around him. And in, in every sport, it's space and time and his ability to, to slow the game down in your mind. We've never had a guy in America who and, can do and, that. And he's, I mean, we've had some good players. Clint Dempsey's a terrific player. They're, you know, they're great, but Land, not, not even like this. Run, but this is the level he's playing at. Is, I don't think for him to have the impact he's had in the Champions League at 18, I don't know that an American's ever had that impact. Maybe like. So John O'Brien was at Ajax and had some success years ago and was a fantastic player, but injuries and stuff cut his career short. But this kid's already having a major impact at a top 10 team in the world in the Champions yeah. League. I mean, that's he's 18. And know? in the last two qualifiers, I think he has. Yeah, he just looks like he's, he's the best player. five assists yeah. or something. Looks like the best player on the field. And he's like, it's his first. It once again proves that the, the old argument about what basketball players would be great soccer players it's really you have to look at like Isaiah Thomas and people like that. It's the lower to the ground guys. Sure, I, I think Pulisic's probably what five, five nine, five ten. I think that's generous. Maybe five eight. Yeah, and Messi's like five seven. Maybe. Maybe five six. Yeah, I it, to me it, it's although I still think Westbrook would be Westbrook on a soccer field yeah. if he had been doing it from day one would have been, It'd been like, interesting. He would have been like uh, Suarez have you, have you multiplied seen, by five. Have, well, you've seen Pogba play. Yeah. Paul Pogba long. He's about, I don't know, 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, you know, he's long, physical, but he's also, you know, great vision and, and great feet. So there, and Ibrahimovic, 6'4", huge feet. But Well, what if Sean Marion had been a goalie from day one? Yeah, he would have been pretty tough to get it by. <laughs> If he's like from age six, he's just in a net. Yeah. Plus, he he's kind he was kind of a quirky guy, and goalies are yeah, quirky. It's true. I actually think he, he would have been a good goalie. He didn't love contact though. Oh, that's bad. You know, I don't know. Maybe he would have been fine. Goalies like, have to I, be okay I, I with think about those like on yeah. corners and stuff. We have to come out in a crowd and demand the, the box. But he so who would have been the best goalie? He would have. I mean, could, he could have been. I mean, he could have jumped so high over everyone there would have been no contact. Right. <laughs> if he had, but uh, I mean, How about I think Raja? it was. You know, I think it was. Uh, Roger would have had no problem. He would have loved the contact. He would have had no problem coming out for the ball. <laughs> but uh, he'd have been kicking it out of bounds for corners. So. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I think that, uh, I think it was David James, uh, goal, played in the Premier League and played uh, for England, goalkeeper. Uh, he wanted to do a TV show where he took, and I'm not sure if he ever did it, he took ex-American college basketball players and tried to teach them to be goalies. And he was like trying to get that kind of six four to six six athlete, yeah. Um, that you know didn't make it in basketball, but was still athletic and long, and and could understand sports and and convert them. I think that's fascinating. I mean, you need a, and you need great hands, hands and you need quick and, the ability to jump from yeah. side to side, Awareness total coordination, and, you know, and you'd have to be a crazy person because yeah. I think goalies have to be a little crazy. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. So, anyways, I think that's a cool. 
show concept. I mean, at least That's for maybe idea. an audience of one. <laughs> no, I, I, I yeah. think, cause think about it in football. They turn, they turn college basketball players into tight ends all the right. time. And it's become like this yeah. talent pool for, right. for tight ends. Well, and yeah, for I mean, goalies, think, it would make more sense. Who, who are the best tight ends of all time? I mean, you could argue Rob Gronkowski is probably the best one, but he wasn't. Okay. But Tony Gonzalez. Yeah. Tony Gonzalez, Antonio Gates. Gates both yeah. two, they're top five. Yeah. And, and, and they played, and hoops. they both played hoops. I mean, who is it, Tate? Who's the other one who got converted? Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham. Yeah. Who's the one? There's a younger guy now too. There's there's a bunch. There's yeah, at least there's five a, or Julius six. Thomas. Yeah, Julius that, Thomas was one. Yeah. There's one other younger. So I mean, one, it, that that is that's interesting. I wonder what other converts we could make in sport crossing sports. This and, is a game. All right, so we're gonna do this. This will be yeah. one of our first reality shows. There you go. We'll find. We'll Kinda go to all of, these different colleges. Think of other sports where it translates or athleticism translate. I mean, football is such a specialty sport. Yeah. You, know, you can find a position arguably for a soccer player. You can play kicker. You know, you Do you think find... it's weird that soccer players have never crossed over and just become field goal kickers on the side? It can't be that yeah, different. No, I, like, yeah. could you, what, what, how, what, what's the farthest you kick a field goal? If you practice yeah, for I mean, three I, weeks, I don't know. I'm not like a huge, I, I don't know that that would be my strength anyways, but yeah, I don't know. I wonder if guys just, it just doesn't appeal to them. To just kick field goals and they'd rather and just kick what us. Is the, what is the what does the kicker make these days? Probably not as much as they would make playing soccer. I mean, obviously not as much as they make soccer. What, would they make as much as they'd you like make? How a much million a year? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, I think Vinatieri's making like four or five million a year. Yeah, it's like four three is the highest Gostkowski. What, what's the minimum? Minimum's got to be yeah. Okay. It's gonna be like oh, you might you might do it. Now you're thinking no, about not, it. Not, you sure? Not, not I. I know, but uh, Get out there. I'm trying to think why. What what would I incentivize some some of these guys to go do that? One last break to talk about SoFi. If you've worked hard to get the career you want, SoFi is here to offer easy savings on the student loans that helped you get there. If you've taken out student loans to invest in yourself and your career, SoFi wants to help out. Attending college and following your passions is an investment, as we know. But with student debt, it can be quite the burden. SoFi is in the business of helping you pay off student debt faster. It's the leader in student loan refinancing. It refinances federal and private student loans to save its members an average of 22,359 total, average monthly savings of 288. Here's how it works. Depending on your eligibility, SoFi pays all of your existing student loans. It gives you one new loan with a lower interest rate, no origination fees, no catch. It's a fast and easy application process. SoFi support team, also a phone call away if you need it. The idea is simple. You've worked hard to get where you are. SoFi wants to help you focus less on debt, more on the future. Right now, you can get a $100 welcome bonus when you refinance at SoFi.com slash BS. Terms and conditions apply. See SoFi.com legal. Loans originated by SoFi Lending Corp. California Finance Lender Law License Number 605-4612. And MLS ID number 1121636. Back to Steve Nash. Um, we got to talk about your old friend, Dirk. Yeah. He's still going. Yeah. I don't I mean, understand this anymore. This he, should be over. He's seven feet tall and he's been playing for 20 pretty years. Good too. Yeah. Like they go to him at the end of games yeah. and he scores on guys who yeah. are 15 years younger than him. I know. It's amazing. I don't understand it. Explain it to me. I, I, I don't understand it. He's, I mean, he, he knows what he, he knows his space, you know, he knows how to, I mean, sometimes I think his feet and, you know, his body are, are, have gone to the stage where like he has to kind of almost force a shot, but sometimes he's still able with his just ability to get a guy off balance or leaning yeah. over commit. He, he's so good at finding his little pocket to get his shot off. Um, I it mean, he said he's seven feet tall. Too. Of course. Yeah, of course you couldn't do it if you're six, four, yeah. but he, he has that gift and he has that know how and some nights it's gotta be really painful for him. It's like he probably can't move that well. And other nights he looks, pretty pretty spry for a an aging player and uh he's, he's i mean he's incredible would you if your body hadn't given up on you would you have just kept going until it gave up or would uh, you have... yeah yeah i would i would have i mean i would have played until i wasn't effective and that's basically what happened because yeah. of the injuries i just couldn't uh, i'd have flashes i'd have practices i'd have game where i'd be like wow i feel great i look great everything's good and then i couldn't recover and just that you know that that diminishing returns you put all that work and you're you're not effective that's no fun so that would have been it if i if i had kept 
playing at an effective rate and level. I would have probably played for a few more years, but defend Dwight Howard for me. Uh, in what way? <laughs> <laughs> Which record? Uh, he, the last six years, he's gone to teams and it just seems like they don't do as well until he leaves. I mean, the two, the two things I will say is that the game's changed. And if you're not fleet of foot in the middle, which he's not anymore, I don't think. Yeah. He's not mobile like he was when he was younger. It's easier to get him in you trouble. Know, get him in trouble defensively. And then, you know, I think he, he's not the same physically as he was. He's not as mobile. And that affects him. And one, I think it affects his his ability offensively regardless, but also in today's game where it's so, you know, the, the returns just aren't there for post to play. Yeah, it's just not like guys can cheat in the lane, crowd it up, and make it difficult. So in, in essence, you got a guy pounding on you. You got other guys making it crowded and hedging their bets and and making you second guess. And you're going to get a jump hook over someone. You know what I mean? Because guys will come to you if you get too deep. It's just the game. There's just not a lot of returns on post up play anymore. And Greg, so, Greg Monroe is the test case for this because he's about as old yeah. school of a post up guy as you get. And he kills the Celtics because the Celtics, the one weakness they have, which doesn't even matter in today's NBA, is yeah. the, the physical post-up yeah. where they just can't keep them away from the rim. But for the most part, the good defensive teams can just right. – that's it, and, he, yeah. and he's not effective. I mean, it's just changed so much. I mean, even even like just centers and – like like how talented Boogie Cousins is and how small the market was for him. Yeah. You know, and he still gets big numbers, but does he have the impact on the game? You know, that's the thing. That, and I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It would seem like the 2005 Amari is the model for what right. you want from your center. The yeah. guy who can be 18 feet from the basket, set you a pick, yeah. and either he's rolling or they're like in there. Yeah. And that's I mean, basketball. Now. I wouldn't even say that. I wouldn't say that because I'd say nowadays you'd have to be either have deeper range or be a better defender. Amari was just oh, that's so interesting. Brilliant. So you think Amari would have to shoot threes now? Uh, he was so brilliant at catching and finishing yeah. that he would have played in any in any generation. But nowadays, what I'm saying is that you can have a guy that is not a good roller at all, but he can stretch a little bit and he can cover a little bit on pick and rolls. Yeah, and you make it up elsewhere rather than having a guy that can really play in that position, but kind of screws your team because the way we play nowadays doesn't isn't conducive to that type of player. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, I mean, basically, it's somebody like Nerlens, which made me mad when Dallas got Nerlens for 50 cents in the dollar. That type yeah. of center and yeah. Clint Capella and the guys like that. Like DeAndre shooting 71% this year yeah. from, from the field. And it's because they don't post them up because mm -hmm. Doc's like, we're not, we're not ever running a play for you. Right. All you're getting are alley-oops and offensive rebounds. And that's a really good use of him. That right. was something Dwight never totally figured out. Right. He just should have been the best version ever of, of DeAndre. And it's a shame because he he committed to that more so in Orlando. They went to the finals. Yeah. And then after that, he was, you know, at the exact time that the post-up game was becoming archaic, he insisted on being a post-up player. Yeah. I think that really hurt him as well. Instead of the game being easier for him and him getting easier looks or his value being bigger because he was – rolling down the lane, sucking the defense in and making his team better and therefore giving him opportunities later to get roles or to get offensive rebounds. You know, he really wanted to prove that he was a post-up player. And it's like right at the <laughs> the exact time it went out of fashion analytically and, by the way, coaches want to play as well. Which offense are you the most jealous of? That you wish you could come back from a time machine 15, I mean, 12 I, years I, ago and just go into it? I love the way the Warriors play. I mean, yeah. the ball moves quickly, and and you know, I, it's not as much pick and roll as I would have liked. But I also never played with guys that could pass like that, so it yeah. would have been nice to be the beneficiary. Like I, I took very little spot up shots in my years in Phoenix. Like, um, you know, never got it back like that. Um, I also didn't get many like back cut layups or things, and so that that's to me is is fascinating and uh, to watch them move the ball and run. It's pick and roll is the hardest thing to, to cover. They have the be, you know they have arguably some of the best pick and roll players, and they kind of in a way run f less pick and roll by far than what they could, and, and than other teams. It's fascinating because they move and share and yeah, they you. run. The, they also run those little leaks that yeah. are like 
you know, Quay seems like he's going to set a pick and then he just darts Slips. back and he's shooting all of yeah, a sudden. I've never seen that before. That's, that's new. That, that, um, you know, I think a lot of that stuff is just reading the defense and, and playing cat and mouse. So like, you know, back in the Utah days, they ran the splits and then the triangle ran the splits where you throw in the post and you have two guards come together and split. But, you know, when you're coming at full speed, you have a good passer with the ball and you have the two best shooters in the world coming together. Yeah. a lot of a lot of opportunity to make mistakes and so they know that and they know that if they're switching or if they're staying at home and then they just started adjusting and put you in difficult positions would you have paid attention to all this advanced metric stuff that we have now when you played because it really started uh, yeah. the last four or five yeah, years it started ago. late in my career i thought it was interesting i i still i would have paid attention to it i would evolved with it as it grew i would have listened to it and at the same time i i still think a huge part of basketball's personalities and how they mix together i agree and so for me that that's we haven't quantified that yet and i don't know that we ever will guess what we're not going yeah. to so, we quantify it with wins right. and losses yeah exactly yeah. so i i always hold on to the fact that it's not everything it's 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 a tool and it's useful and i think it gives us a lot of good data and a lot of good ideas but it helps us understand yeah. some of what we're watching sure. but sure the whole you, thing can't be an algorithm it just can't well i mean the 2010 suns are a good example mm. team probably shouldn't have been as good as it was right. but the pieces everyone played well together the pieces fit you had yeah. guys at the right points of their career who understood what was going sure. on i think we were picked out of the playoffs that year preseason you should have been yeah, I mean, I remember thinking it was, you know, what's yeah. going to happen with Nash? I, you weren't even a free agent yet. I think you had no. signed another deal. I think I and it was like, oh, man, left. poor Nash. He's going to be stuck. And all of a sudden, you guys were really good. But yeah. it was because everybody meshed. I think the Celtics are the Celtics are both advanced metric friendly, but also a team that doesn't make sense. Hmm. Not very good rebounding. They play three, four guards at the same time sometimes. But it just, they play well together so that that that's an example of personality is that one personality two they have some gritty guys yes you know competitors without that you know they are soft jump shooting team right and but they have some gritty guys that get deflections and steals and chip physical, on the shoulder guys chip on the shoulder and and i think you know although isaiah is small he has a chip smart as a chip jay crowder uh, does crowder has a bradley chip. does yep so you got bradley so you got a group of guys that make up for a lot of things by their personality. Horford didn't have a chip because we gave him $30 million a year, but then he had a, like two weeks where he wasn't putting up rebounds and everyone, because Boston, it's 24-7. Oh, Al Horford, next contract sucks. Yeah. Now he's a maniac. It was, it was like the Boston, yeah. all that stuff kind of got him going. Now he's like flying around like a crazy person. The yeah. whole, it's, I, I, I think Washington is the, the danger to them because it's probably the second round opponent. And it's just a bad matchup right. with the wall yeah. and Beal combo. I think Washington's kind of the, for me, it's the sleeper. I don't know what to make of Toronto because I don't know if Kyle Lowry's coming back. But Washington is the one that scares me. They they just ran Cleveland off the court on Saturday night. Yeah, no, they're good. I mean, they, and you know, as you know, in the playoffs and in every sport, but it's, you know, I think it's about finding your stride. And I think Washington's starting to find like some real belief that they could cause some problems. And yeah. Um, so I and think Beal's really good. That's he's good. Thing. He's good. They're both very good, and they're gaining they're gaining momentum and confidence, and that's dangerous. What are you doing for the Warriors? Just consulting? Yeah, basically. Yeah, so I'm just basically a resource. So you know, I go up and try to spend three days a month with them. But other than that, I'm just here if they want me to look at something or deal with something, and just a resource for anyone that coaches or players that. that Steph need. seems like he'd be in your wheelhouse as. So yeah, talk I mean, hoops with and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, he's a great guy and great to talk hoops with. At the same time, there's not a lot to coach the guy on. Yeah, true. <laughs> you know, he's he's got it dialed. So, like, hey, Steph, ever thought about yeah shooting a 32 right. foot three instead right. of a 31 foot sure. three? Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's it's phenomenal to be associated with a great organization. I love Steve Kerr, love the culture he's built. Uh, you know, so it, it's one of those things where I'm happy to be involved in the game still. Uh, I love my time there and want more of it and I don't have more time. So it's kind of like this kind of frustrating, but kind of perfect scenario for me. So would you ever want to go all in and run a team or anything or down the road? We'll maybe? see, you know, I, we'll see. I mean, right now I'm like, I, I really love waking up with my kids, taking them, just getting them fed, getting them to school, picking yeah. them up after school, being 
an Uber driver for the next four or five hours. We're, and we're chauffeurs. Yeah, exactly. Parents are chauffeurs. I, you know, and I, I really value that. And that, that part of their life, that impressionable stage of their life is going to go and you never get it back. And so for me, like I've, I worked and worked and worked and put myself in a position where I can still work and do things, but I can do them on my terms and still have that. So right now I'm still really, really valuing that over changing my lifestyle and losing that, even though some of the opportunities that I could have are really exciting. Are you, are any of your kids playing youth soccer? My one daughter played club this last year, last couple of years, but I think that's going to be it. It's just, it was just crazy. You know, you have first, so she's in club volleyball now, both of them. Oh. I mean, the, the clubs that gets the monetization of sports, you have to choose at 12 or younger. That's what I was going to ask you. It's How would you fix the youth sports scene? I, I, I hate would, it. My I, daughter is basically all soccer now and she's yeah. not even 12 yet and it bothers me. It just sucks. It does. And I think it's, you know, you can, I don't know that you can change it. It's like, and basically what it looks like to me is like, it's monetization. The club says, well, if I can have this kid for 11 months, I can charge him 200, you know, 2,500 or 4,500 or whatever it is for the year instead of sharing it with volleyball, you yeah. know, soccer, baseball, whatever it is. And so it's someone saying, look, this is the way our business model works. But that, I think that's why some of the MRIs are tough when you look at our young guys coming in the league because they've been on the same r same roller coaster Circuit, tracks yeah. for 15 years already. Um, whereas, you know, other other eras, guys were cross training, playing different sports, which I also think gave you a lot. I think the parents that, you know, try to specialize early and try to, you know, buy the 10,000 hours, it's a mistake. You know, I think some kids obviously are going to get through, but it's, for me, it's about a kid's love for the sport. And one way to keep them loving it is to have them play other sports. So here's the frustrating part to this, because I 100% agree with you, but these kids now, and I even include my daughter in this, where they're good at one sport and they don't want, they, they mess around with the second sport and they're not the best at it. And there's kids that are better and they lose confidence. And mm -hmm. it's almost like everybody's so afraid to fail now. That's mm -hmm. been frustrating for me as a parent. I don't know. My it daughter is. played basketball on her school team and she was the second best player on the team. They lost in the final. She felt like it was her fault and she didn't never practice. And oh, it's like, it's, it's fine. Yeah. You're 11. Yeah. You made the finals. This is great. Tell her to come talk to me. Lost a few games in my day. So. Yeah, yeah, but I, it seems like people either want to be, they're all no, in, agree. they can't just casually do right, anything. Right, and you, you know, you, it gets frustrating. You can't, you have to commit to a sport and if you miss a sport or you don't play well, you feel like you're not going to make it the next year and everything's about results, results, results instead of like development and enjoyment. And these, these academy teams now, when you hit like 12, 13 mm -hmm. in LA in the Southern California and they're playing four three hour practices a week hmm. and then they have tournaments in the weekends they're playing three four games a weekend you know and like and i don't like, remember what, how what many is this i don't remember having the amount of homework my kids have in the sixth grade like yeah. how do you how do they like their time is like they're not just out on the street playing like we like and we they're grew up slime playing. that's another slime. thing everyone's I got to ban slime. that i ban that i told them there's a lot of carcinogens so it's not allowed in my house which is well, you see what happened but, so slime for people who don't know I don't know if it's Southern California or everywhere, but all these kids ages third to like seventh grade are making slime out of like borax yeah, and that's glue. What it was. So I was like, no, no more. All these, that. So here's what happened. And it's terrible, but somebody got third degree burns from making it the wrong way. And all the parents now are forwarding around like, this is what happens. Yeah. If, so hopefully slime is going to die. Let's hope it's gone. It seems like it was one of the worst ideas ever. I was oh. in my daughter's bedroom two weeks ago and there's this big borax. Yeah bottle and i'm like <laughs> yeah, that's not a good borax yeah. in your room yeah. like what that's what not, is this not oh, good. slime slime's the worst i I, can't, I don't get it like she got like we got in a fight the other day about something and she's like well you took away my slime like like it was some therapeutic measure God. i was like just what's please, happened to society relax like, they, i've been in canada they don't have slime uh, I, I hope not it's two two quick questions we're going uh <laughs> freeze um 2020 olympic the Canadian team, are we mm -hmm. in good shape? Could be, I mean, for sure. I mean, I think we have the second most NBA players now to the U.S. Um, Wiggins, Tibbs put a lot of minutes on Wiggins. You have to talk Tibbs. He did. Wiggins is headed for 3,000 minutes. Yeah, hey, he Tibbs, should, slow down. You're not should, making the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> he should be okay for 2020, but yeah. his career could be over by 2024. <laughs> slow down, Tibbs. But, uh, you know, I think those guys, they, if, if they take pride, this is, this is, again, this is a generation, so... I don't know if the Olympics means as much anymore. 
it should for the Canadians. They've it never should. even like yeah. made the I know, but like metal. But it's again, it's your peer groups and your your like you know your your circle on Instagram and Snapchat. Do they care about the Olympics or do they? Well, just... it's like what we just talked about youth sports. I don't want to go. We're gonna lose. It'll be right. embarrassing. Sure. Yeah. So like. So you got Wiggins, Tristan Thompson. Yep. Corey Joseph, Stauskas, Olenek. Olenek, uh, nice stretch five for the Olympics. Yep. Um, Anthony you know, Bennett didn't work out. Anthony we Bennett, can, he, can, we, you know, can we he, save him? We'll see. We'll see. You know, he, he, he could come back in the fold. Um, we could have uh, Tyler Ennis. We'll see what happens with him. I'm uh, not giving up on Tyler Ennis yet. No. And, uh, you know, there's... Uh, I don't know where these guys will stack up, but Andrew Nicholson and some of these guys that are still in the league and, okay. you know, in the international game, they can stretch and, and shoot. So and Wiggins, so, Olenek, high screens. A lot of that. Um, you know, the other one we have, uh, the best, is he a freshman or 10th grader in the country right now? Uh, RJ Barrett. Making, oh, that's good. Why don't you make a deal with LeVar Ball to get them dual yeah. Canadian U.S. citizenship. I, I don't even think they're Get American. They're just them. Los Angeles citizens. He doesn't want them to play anywhere <laughs> they else. They belong to their uh, <laughs> country of Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, last question: Soccer. Who's give me your top three right now? Players. Players. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you kind of have to put Ronaldo in there. See, everybody says it that way. We don't yeah. say that with basketball, where yeah. we're like disappointed. It's like, I, I guess we have to put LeBron one. Yeah. And with Ronaldo, it's always, eh, I guess Ronaldo. I, mean, I, I don't think he's he. I I don't know. I, I feel like maybe I've swung the other way. It's like the MVP race. I think it says more about you and and our personalities collectively than it does about the actual players. Right. Yeah. You know, so part of me is like, maybe Ronaldo's not necessarily my favorite guy, and so I don't rate him as highly as he should, but. Um, I think he, in some ways, if I were to knock him, I'd say he, he's he's at times benefits from playing on such a, a great team where like yeah. Messi's team would struggle without him. Um, having said that, Ronaldo's been unbelievable for a long, long time. So he's basically LeBron, I, right? Yeah, Everybody's just I picking mean, him apart he's, every year. He's he's what he's been able to accomplish and the things he's done, and but he's just he, he's not the type of guy who's going to pick the ball up, dribble through the team anymore, and score like Messi can or like he could have done ten years ago. Um, but he still has, has changed his game and adapted and gets in the right spots to finish, and his numbers are staggering. Strong hair, strong hair I mean, game. The guy physically, place. physically, he's you know he's he's going to do all, I'll do all right. You know, Friday night he'll be fine. But um, so I, Messi, one. Messi to me though is number one. He's the best oh. player to ever play the game. Okay, for me, best player to ever play the game. Um, you know, like I know in Argentina they love Maradona, but. You know, Maradona played in an era where guys smoked cigarettes at halftime, and half the guys were stayed in, stayed in South America. Right. You know, whereas nowadays there's like over 200 Brazilians in the Champions League, and you could probably say the same for Argentina almost. And you know, they're, you're playing against track stars every day in a congested fixture schedule, and every game is worth so much and seen so far around the world. And what he's able to do under those parameters is 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 off the charts. And, it, and Thierry Henry tells a story about. Um, one day in practice, I, I've been to a Barcelona practice before, and they'll play like 11 a side, like a full game, but on half a field, full goal and everything. And even in that half a field, the 20 players, excluding the goalies, will be within 15 yards, like the lines of the two defense. They're all bunched up, right? And it's like just this unbelievable speed of thought and, and ability and the way they tic-tac and play in those tight spaces. But apparently one day, and, then, and we're talking about when this happened, they're the best team in the world and arguably one of the best teams ever. Messi looked to the coach for a foul, didn't get it, was pissed, ran back to his goalie when his goalie got the ball and said basically like tin cup, like ball. Get, gets the ball, dribbles through basically 20 players, scores and stares at the coach. I mean, it's so <laughs> unheard of. Like that's not even like, I don't Jordan can even like, you, can't, you know what I mean? There's not even an equivalence in... In um in basketball, so it, he, I, for me, he's the best player to ever play the game. He does the two things he does better than anyone I've ever seen are when he's in front of somebody and they're trying to catch him from behind, and you could just get tripped at any yeah. time. He has a way of dancing over the trips, yeah, he and, does. He, and they never actually trip him. Yeah, and then um, and then his ability when he's going by somebody to hop over their feet and yeah. keep and sure. like nothing ever happened. Sure. I've just never seen anybody do stuff like that. It's like a ballerina. Yep. And that's why guys are so, yeah, I mean, one way to kind of explain it is too, is when he's, a, he's running at you, he's putting his, he's so low to the ground and, and he's small and he uses it to his advantage and quick, he puts his feet down more than you do. So like yeah. as you're picking yours up, he's 
and he's gone the other way, you know, or fakes the other way. You're trying to recover and recover again, and he's gone. And I mean, he's just what basketball players like that. Man, he's. I mean, it's a little bit of. I mean, they're totally different, but a little bit of what it seems like it would be to guard James Harden. When yeah, a little just, bit. You're going think, backwards, and you don't know I, I, how to. Yeah, a little bit, but I think the 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 in overall ability, but. I think that it's that's true in transition, but I think it's more like the water bug, the like quick the, feet thing. Like Isaiah, like if Isaiah Thomas got the ball, he's coming at you full head of steam at the top of the key, you know, from his own foul line. True, not a lot gonna happen. You know, like, you have no idea which way he's going you know, or pull up, and you're kind of like, oh wow, you know, <laughs> there he goes again. So I think that's kind of the the same analogy, but it, obviously it's you know he's able they, to, they don't call Isaiah anymore for the push off, which has helped his thirty points a game. When did they stop good, calling you for the push-offs? Great, like I mean, 2006? Great, <laughs> great, great Did you guys. have to win the MVP first? Uh, probably. I think it was after my second. When did you realize you could push off on the drives? Um, you know what I, I did? I learned from Kevin Johnson was when a guy went to hand check you, like grab his arm. Oh. So it was like whenever you'd re reach to get a little hand check in, he would grab, like a martial arts almost, grab your, your hand and pull you the way you're going that sounds which like is, donald trump's handshakes when oh, he goes to handshake somebody oh, pulls them amazing, in and knocks them off that. let's not even go there but, so uh, you do the so you would pull so if a guy reached and you either swiped his hand like so he's reaching towards you, you keep his hand going behind you, you yeah i mean so he's coming even farther towards you as you're going by him that was kind of did insta you feel like you got superstar calls at the end not Once really. you became a superstar, you uh, never felt it? Not really. Because um, you know, Westbrook now is the all-time, just gets everything. No, it's like I, he goes into traffic, he's getting yeah, a call. I never really felt that at all, actually. But oh, um, you went the other I, way. You I felt like just, you weren't getting enough I, calls. I, I, well, I never really wanted, like, don't give me calls. But like sometimes I felt like I could have gotten a call and I didn't get it. But, but there were times when you would drive into the basket of a big guy and you're just bouncing off them, trying to get the layup up and trying to get the three-point play. Yeah, there's a lot of times, though, that they didn't care. I think maybe I wasn't that explosive, and they would just be like, no. Good, good, <laughs> keep, that keep, working? keep begging. So um, we got – so you have Messi one, Ronaldo Messi one, two, I put and Pulisic Ronaldo there. three. <laughs> I would love to see Pulisic him be three. B? I would love to see Ronaldo him be Ronaldo 2A, uh, Pulisic 2B? I think Neymar's – So Neymar to me is – he's like the Mark Messier slash – I, uh, Come again? I don't even know. Well, like, you... well, just well in hockey, like Mark Messier as, as a sidekick. was the, the gamer. Okay. He was the quote unquote sidekick, but he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And in the big games, would yeah. rise to the occasion, and you could really rely yeah. on him. I don't even know if there's an NBA equivalent of that because in the NBA, yeah. everyone's a superstar. But Neymar, oh. like in the French yeah. game, yeah, he, Neymar played yeah, the PSG. best seven minutes of soccer I've ever seen he, in my life. He was actually great the whole game. His, and I, I think that's sometimes what people. I think his detractors sometimes don't realize like how hard it is to play against top teams and to want the ball and to constantly try to go by someone. Yeah. Like it, he, he, even the pressure, the playing great teams, he's still just continually trying to take someone on, which, you know, if he gets tackled 50 times and the one time he gets by someone and gets it across the face of goal and hits someone and goes in, you win. Yeah. So like his, his ability to continually like never lose his confidence, never lose that will to beat someone off the dribble. I mean that he's in that PSG game when they had basically 10 guys in front of their 18 yard amazing. box, he still tried to go every time. Yeah. And I just, I respect him as a winner and a battler and a fighter, like to say like, I'm going, because if we can't just keep lofting the ball and we got to try to beat somebody before we make a pass into that area. And so he did have that seven minutes, but I actually left because when PSG, we were on vacation, when PSG, three, got the, uh, PSG got the away goal, I was like, forget it. My wife was like, how long is this game? I was like, all right, we can go now. And so I missed the seven minutes and I already left thinking, man, uh, Neymar was unbelievable today. Like attacked every time was so much, he got fouled a hundred times, he, yeah. you know, which, so I, he's, he's up there, he's closing the gap on, on, on Messi in a way, but Messi's just out of this world. Neymar's my favorite. He, my favorite he, non He's one of my favorite ever, um, athletes and like the way he moves his ability to like move is so graceful fast um his balance his coordination his creativity i mean he's just one of the most beautiful athletes i've ever seen you know what else i like is he's got he's got a little f you in him for sure 
Which, he wouldn't. He wouldn't be where he is. Yeah, you know, he wouldn't be in the top three if he didn't. He, he'll, ta- he'll take someone down once in a while yeah. just because he's mad he's at mad. something, and my, it's like, I'm gonna take this guy out. I'm mad. Uh, being a Tottenham fan, I, I think the same of Deli Alley. I don't know if yeah. you've watched him. He's an unbelievable young player, and he's just on the edge of being sometimes, you know, too much. He's got so much confidence, but he's also got like that, you know, like I don't care who you are. I, we can just start fighting right now and I'll beat you up. Like kind of thing for like yeah. a skinny 20 year old. Can you imagine if Draymond was a soccer player? Oh, <laughs> There'd be some red cards. There'd be some reds. Uh, yeah. Draymond's team's down to nothing. Oh God, somebody's rolling around <laughs> on the ground. What happened? The ball's over there. <laughs> yeah. Draymond on a corner kick, just he, take yeah. it out, dudes. He'd have been a old school center he back. He did it yesterday for sure. in Beverly. Did you see that? No, missed it. Beverly was getting a little frisky, so Draymond just laid him out on a pick. And Beverly loved it. He got up. He's, I mean, Draymond and Beverly are going to be the yeah. third world war if it ever happens. They're, so they're just soulmates. Be, yeah. They're, <laughs> when it happens, it'll just, that's it. Everyone's going to have to right. run out of the arena as they fight to the death. I love it. Uh, you want to plug your charity soccer thing? Yeah. Yeah. This is our 10th year. Uh, Steve Nash Foundation showdown charity soccer game in New York City. June 21st. It's usually um, the week before the draft. It's the night before the draft every year. Oh, great. Year. Yeah, the night before the draft. It's a seven-a-side soccer game on the Lower East Side. NBA players and international soccer stars. We've had, you know, unbelievable crew of guys over the years. Thierry Henry, Robbie Fowler, Steve McManaman, Zanetti, Cordoba, Giuseppe Rossi comes every year. Um, you know, go down the line, we've had some unbelievable players. Can you get Pulisic? I think we could, that would be huge. I would him take him year. under his under your wing right now. Yeah, just, does, does he ever seen a basketball well, I, I, game? You just gotta I'll, reach out there. What I'll say to him is, you can. This can be your game if you yeah. come this year for the tenth anniversary. I'll put your name in the title. Yeah, it'll be yours yeah, for, forevermore. Yes. Get him, so, get in on him early. That would be huge if we can get. Who is the man. best NBA player that's ever been in that game? Uh, I mean, in terms of how good they were at soccer. Yeah, I think like Luol Deng. Leandro Barbosa. Well, dang, I would I would have guessed Barbosa. Yeah, those two are. Um, is Barbosa just going to play until he's fifty? Because he's such a good guy, people want him on the yeah, team. I think so. Is he like the ultimate example it's, of that? How old is he, is LB? I, now? I think he's uh, my age. He's like forty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> um, he could play a while, and he loves it. He loves it. But Dudley's so. another one. Dudley will yeah. play till as long as he wants. He's yeah. like, and then he'll move into that Juwan Howard assistant coach, right. good guy yeah. role. He'd be great at that. Yeah, if, if he doesn't get a media gig. He loves his media too. I know. I got to have him on soon. He, yeah, I he, get jealous he when must he's be on great. other, other he things. He must be great. Yeah, have you yeah had him he's on? good. I've yeah. had him on. He's good. He's getting yeah. better too. Got All right, opinions. Steve Nash. It was a pleasure. It's fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to T-Mobile. Don't forget, baseball season's coming up. They're giving a free year of MLB.TV premium. That's an almost $113 value, absolutely free, only for T-Mobile customers. Unlimited data. That means unlimited baseball. Download the T-Mobile Tuesdays app from the app store on april 4th you get your free year of mlb.tv premium in that t-mobile tuesdays app or go to t-mobile.com backslash mlb blackouts and other restrictions apply see terms of use for details and thanks so much to cabbage they help small business owners access simple flexible funding right away without the headaches that come with applying for a traditional loan it's a simple way for businesses to get flexible access to up to $100,000, visit cabbage.com slash BS, and you'll get a $100 Visa gift card when you qualify. That is K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com slash BS. Don't forget, I'm on channel 33 with the Reese Witherspoon podcast. If you love Reese Witherspoon, I'll listen to that one. Me, Amanda, and Juliet, and also the Mass Man Show is doing WrestleMania all week. I think I'm going on that one on Friday too. And we have another BS podcast coming up on Friday with a famous person. Steve Nash is a famous person, another famous person and a good conversation coming on Friday. I would mark this one on your calendar until then the BS podcast. 